Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Canadian Arcade. This episode is going to be Mike from HomePin during his 2017 presentation at Vancouver Flipout talking about HomePin, starting the company, some of the challenges he's had, and the new upcoming Thunderbirds pinball machine that they've got in the works. As well, we're going to have a few questions and answers at the very end of the video that we asked Mike during the presentation. Now, for those of you who don't know, Thunderbirds is based off of a 1960s British sci-fi television series that most Commonwealth countries like Canada and Australia and Great Britain all got to see. Not so much in America. Anyways, we're all a little excited for this. So, without further ado, here's Mike. Hello, everybody. Woo. Thank you for coming out to our speaker series and uh, uh, I have to say that the attendance for Vancouver Flip Out has been absolutely fantastic. Uh, I know we're already talking about next year down at the Roundhouse. It's going to be bigger, uh, better, more speakers, more vendors, everything. Uh, but I tell you right now, these guys that showed up here, uh, all of the speakers today, uh, I'll tell you right now are number one in my books because um, you know they've supported this uh, thing from the very beginning. Last year Jack came out. Uh, and he jumped on top of the table. It was fantastic. We're not, we're not sure if he's going to do that again this year. Uh, but um, yeah, please give these guys a big round of applause for showing up for doing this. So uh, our first speaker uh, has come a long way. I think the longest way out of anybody today. Uh, Mike Kalinowski, he's come from China. And for those of you who don't know, uh, he's in charge of HomePin and responsible for uh, uh, that company out there, and he's gonna give you uh, a full update on what's happening with uh, Thunderbirds and a variety of other stuff that they do, including boards and, um, yeah, all kinds of good stuff. So, thank you. Thank you, Tommy, and thank you, everybody, for coming along. I know there's lots of stuff you could be doing out there, playing pinball instead of listening to our boring speeches, but uh, here we are. Um, I have no doubt others will wander in, and if you need to wander out, go to the loo or whatever you want to do, that's fine. Don't feel embarrassed about it. Just head off, head off out if you've got to go for 10 minutes or something. Um, and uh, especially you. <laughs> <laughs> and, and please excuse me if I refer to these notes. I've got a fair bit of stuff to cover in a pretty short period of time, and I don't really want to miss anything. And uh, I'm not going to follow it word for word, but it'll give me some prompting. Um, Tommy's asked me and invited me here today to basically not so much talk about the product we're currently building but to actually give a bit of background history because many people have heard of HomePin or they know about HomePin or, or Thunderbirds but they don't exactly know who I am, where I've come from, how, how come I'm involved in pinball. So Tommy's asked me to specifically speak about how it is and how it was that I became involved in pinball and um, so uh, that's that's what we're basically going to cover today and then we'll finish off at the end with some talk on Thunderbirds and the factory and so on and what, what we get up to. Um, I should have done that earlier, shouldn't I? Thanks for coming on. There you go. Um, a lot of people early in the piece when, when I first started the factory in China about three and a half years ago didn't take me seriously. Uh, they didn't really know, well most people don't know much about China. Even people that have visited China sort of go there for a few days and leave. They don't fully understand how it works. Uh, I'd actually already been trading in China for nearly 10 years, uh, buying and selling. I had a small apartment in Guangzhou for quite a few years. And um, I, I was familiar with how things worked there. I knew how to get around. I had plenty of contacts. And I thought I was pretty sweet for, for getting things going. And that's one of the major reasons I decided that I should go ahead with the venture. And uh, it didn't quite pan out that way, but anyway. Um, early in the piece, um, I, I actually started an apprenticeship when I was 16, uh, an electronics apprenticeship, and my first job was um, was at a radio control model radio control factory, and um, we manufactured radio control systems for modelers primarily, but also for government departments. And my mates hated me because part of my job through the week was to go out to the local flying field and fly model aeroplanes, and I was paid to do that. And you know, as a 19 year old flying model aeroplanes for a job, that was like unheard of in those days. It was just, you know, they hated me. They didn't like it. But it wasn't all plane sailing when I was out there because uh, there were a few problems sometimes. Uh, but my job was to test the radio gear to, with various functions of it, range and flutter and all sorts of different things and, and come back with the report and then we'd tweak the electronics and improve on it and so on. And so um, that's, that was my 
introduction to electronics early on and into manufacturing as well because uh, at PSA in Brisbane we made everything, the lot. We, we made the printed circuit boards ourselves. I mean, we don't even do that today, obviously. We send them out to a professional printed circuit factory, but we actually manufactured our own printed circuit boards in-house. We made our own packing. Uh, we did everything right from scratch. And so that got me interested and involved in electronics and manufacturing of electronics at a very early age. So uh, that was sort of the introduction to it. Uh, while I was in Brisbane, I met Karen, who lived next door. She was literally the girl next door. I was living... Uh, living with my uncle and auntie because my parents moved out of town. That's my sin bin there uh, next door. And this is Karen and myself in her yard this side. That's a GM car for those who don't know what it is. It's a General Motors Holden. And mine was a Ford, Ford Falcon. And um, she was the girl next door. I met her. She was 16 in that photo. And uh, by the way, I probably should have mentioned that this, this story that I'm going to tell is a fair bit of personal stuff in it, so I think that's necessary for everybody to understand the full implications of, of what's happened in the last few years. <coughs> um, that was my first job as a pinball technician. Um, this particular picture is the oldest one I've got with me in a pinball machine. That's a Williams Pocorino that we'd just unpacked that week. And uh, the flowers were from my boss for, for Karen for the birth of our son, to take to the hospital for the birth of our son, and he's 39 now, so uh, that's how I date that picture. Um, you like the pants? Nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I was working for, a, for EMI, actually, which is HMV. I don't know if you guys know of those companies. I was a field service technician for EMI. Uh, one of my friends worked in this industry, and they had mostly... EM machines and lots of jukeboxes, this company, Music Time in Brisbane had a lot of jukeboxes. Uh, but they had just taken delivery of one of the very first solid state machines, a, a Bally Playboy in Brisbane. And uh, the guys there were used to working on EMs, they were ex-telephone people, they had no real electronics knowledge, they've opened up this thing and all fainted and didn't know what to do. So this guy that was a mutual family friend got onto me and invited me over there one afternoon for beers on a Friday and I had a look at it and I was able to identify some of the more obvious things, and even though obviously I hadn't seen a pinball machine inside before. And um, that was a Friday, I started work there the next Monday. Uh, and worked for them for quite a few years. And uh, introduced basically the rest of the technicians on how to service solid state machines and so on. Um, Karen and I moved to Cairns then, which is right up north of Queensland. Brisbane's down the south of Queensland. Cairns is in the tropical area, tourist area at the top. And um, uh, I was actually transferred there as the manager of, of a uh, amusement machine company, but about a year later they went broke for all sorts of <coughs> unusual reasons. And um, we didn't know what to do at that point. There wasn't much chance of getting a job there, so we started our own business. And uh, built that up from nothing to a uh, staff of 12. That's when I realised I was an idiot because we only actually had 11. The payroll was paying 12 people, but there was always somebody on holidays. So we were paying for 12, but only had 11, and we thought this is a bit crazy. So that's, again, a little more introduction into, into uh, how I was involved. Karen went and did an apprenticeship herself in electronics, so she was actually a technician, and um, helped me quite a lot with uh, pinball boards later on in life. And um, we built a house in Coranda, which is up in the hills from Cairns, in the forest, that's it taken I took that photo from my aeroplane about, well, 1998 about, and uh, that's it. That's the house in the, in the forest, that's the dead end street there, uh, can't go anywhere. Still got that house today, my son lives there. Uh, this is um, under the house, under that house, uh, in my electronic workshop, developing um, a replacement board for um, Bram Stoker's Dracula. This is how I sort of became in, re-involved with pinball because I'd sort of fallen out a little bit having the TV business and so on. I, I was quite some time, maybe 10 years, and I had, didn't have much to do with, um, with pinballs or amusements. I, from time to time I was asked to fix things, and, and, but I didn't really have a great deal of interest either. Uh, but someone brought it to my attention that they had a, a Dracula that they couldn't get the, the parts for this board. This is the Mist, Mist Multiball board, and it's simply not available on the part that was used on it that gives the trouble is... Um, is a chip that is no longer made. Even NOS, there was just no chips around. It was a special chip, an infrared receiver chip. So I set about redesigning the board. I, I totally redesigned the circuitry. And uh, that tape measure there is showing that it's 24 inches because it's a 24 opto board. And uh, it, it's actually incorrectly named in the manual. It says 24 opto board. They mean 24 inch opto board. 
and um, that actually tricked me a little bit at first because I couldn't get on, I couldn't work out what's this 24 octos they're on about. That's, it's not. It's one octo, but it's 24 inch span. But anyway, I redesigned that board. This is uh, just proving on the bench that it worked. That was my sample that I built. That I made that prototype myself at home because that's just what you have to do. If I was to send boards away, um, it'd take weeks to get samples, and you know, it just wouldn't happen. So that was basically the first home pin product, if you like. And uh, since then, we've probably sold, well, certainly more than 200 of those. We make them in batches of 100. Now, in fact, they're making a batch of 100 right now in the factory uh, while I'm here of that board. So uh, that's probably the last batch that we made. I think that's the same board. Yes, it is. It's a batch of, um, of opto, 24 opto boards. Uh, they, they sell all around the world. They sell a lot in Australia, obviously, but uh, we ship everywhere. We've got agents in most countries. Uh, Terry from Pinball Livestock's our products. And, um, and we make them in much larger batches than before. Karen and I used to assemble 10 or 20 under the house in the little workshop. Now we build them mostly in batches of 100 or 200. Uh, it's just the cost effective way to do it. That's a bunch of uh, trough opto boards. Again, we try and recreate the board as true to the original as possible. If there's some features we believe we can add or some known faults or problems that the boards have, we correct those where possible. We thicken up the tracks so that when you pull apart out, you don't rip all the tracks off. Uh, we're just, just obvious things like that that probably should have been done originally. And uh, you know, we put on telltale LEDs so you can see when the board's there and so on. Um, but, but on the whole, we try and keep the board as original as possible. Um, that's my dog helping me unpack a pinball machine <laughs> and um, helping me repair one. Uh, a container, I had a bit of a story about this container. Uh, I'm not sure that's so relevant. It was, uh, it's probably out of order sequence in this, in this system, but this is a container being delivered to Brisbane of um, goods that I'd purchased and shipped to Brisbane. Uh, just one of, uh, I've lost count, but a lot of containers. Um, this, when I realised that, that there was a little bit of a business to be had in, uh, in China, uh, I'd already rented, I already had an apartment there, so I, uh, I rented a small warehouse and the place was only just big enough to, uh, to take a 20 foot container full of goods because I, I had several businesses I was doing things for, buying smaller amounts of things, having certain things made for them and you know, they'd be coming from here, there and everywhere and it was very difficult to, co to get all those together to load a container. So we would just bring everything back to this place until we had the, had the stuff to load and then we would load the container. And um, it's hot work loading a container in, in Guangzhou, I can tell you. Uh, that's, that's, our, that's ready to close the doors. And um, that was a particularly steamy night, I remember that. And uh, as the business seemed to stabilise and grow a little bit, we, we took on a few staff. Uh, this guy here is an Australian guy who, uh, who did other things, 3D printers and things, and, uh, and we decided that we wanted to rent a factory together, start a factory together. He wanted to do things, I wanted to do pinball machines, and so initially we, um, we rented quite a large factory space in, uh, in Shenzhen, <coughs> and they were the first three staff that came on board and were with us for quite a while. And, um, we look after our staff well, they get free cakes for birthdays and that sort of stuff. That's not what people normally are told about China, I know, but it's just nothing like what, what you generally read about in the press, the sweatshops and all that stuff. It's just complete rubbish. And, uh, this was looking for the premises. We went around quite a few different places with some real estate agents looking at places. And uh, the biggest issue, I guess, in China when you're looking for somewhere to rent is that you don't rent a place and it's like this and you can see it and there's nice carpet and you can choose to keep it or not. You get it with nothing. You don't even get PowerPoints or lights. It's an empty building. It's an empty shell. And you have to basically put everything in that you want to put in. And it's expected that when you leave, you'll take the PowerPoints with you. Uh, and that's just how it works. That You just rip the place to pieces and, and you get it with nothing. And that's another place we looked at. And that's what happens. They take stuff out. They just leave the wreckage behind. So that's how you get it. The landlord is just too lazy to even sweep the floor. That's what you get. And um, eventually we settled on this place. And uh, that we had, we had this ground floor area and uh, another a floor five in the adjacent building. Most, most factories in China are in closed compounds where there'll be a group of several buildings with one entrance and a guard at the entrance who knows who's supposed to be there and not there and he looks after deliveries and, and so on. 
and uh, most of those places are shared by up to a dozen different businesses. So we had this ground floor section and we had floor five, the whole of floor five which was massive. And um, this whole complex actually originally was uh, Skyworth, you probably never heard of Skyworth. Uh, Skyworth is a tiny little company, they've got 80,000 employees <coughs> and they are the world's largest manufacturer of set-top boxes. Uh, practically every set-top box sold is a Skyworth set-top box rebadged with RCA or whatever on it. Uh, so this was actually their factory. They, they had several factories around Shenzhen and they built a brand new building and combined all of their factories into one and moved all of their employees into the one area. So this became available and it was pretty timely. And, um, they're putting up a wall there. We took half of the building because the building is exceptional. I don't know how long it is. It's, it's very, very long. It's like uh, 800 metres long. And uh, we took half the building. Uh, but as you can see, that's how we inherited the building with all this junk and rubble. And these guys, when they built this brick wall, left piles of junk behind as well. So it's just what happens. It was a lesson in, in learning to live with. But this is the upstairs area. That's when we moved in there. And uh, as you can see, the wiring just thrown on the floor there, and that's it. Uh, we put fans in, and we put uh, lighting, and sorted the place out of it, and workbenches, and so on. And that's a bit of a before and after. There's a couple of those. There, the main office. Uh, it's pretty hard to get a picture of it because it's it's a, a upstairs is like it's about from here to that wall, and very long, and divided off into several rooms. So we've got a separate office area, and, a, and a, an electronic assembly area, and so on. And that's looking back up. The top floor there is the office area. Behind the truck, down in there is the wood room, down in all this area behind there. And um, that's after we cleaned all the junk out, obviously. Um, and that was my first car in China, a Nissan dual cab. Um, we needed a vehicle to get stuff, move stuff around. I didn't particularly want to buy a new car there. I didn't want to spend the money on it for a start. And uh, we wound up with that car. But as it turned out, something I didn't know when I bought it was that in China, trucks at 15 years get crushed. You can't register them anymore. And even worse, at, 40, <coughs> at 14 years, you can't transfer the registration to anybody else. And of course, I found that out just after the time. So <laughs> I was stuck with it. And, uh, and it was a good car. It was a very good car. I was very pleased with it. It did, did a lot of work for us. Uh, that's the empty factory, the first tool <coughs> that I bought, making the first steel workbench. Um, basically starting with nothing, uh, which is how we did it. Delivery of machinery, CNC machine being delivered. Vacuum forming machine. Uh, we use that for packaging and also for test runs. This machine can only do up to one millimeter material. Uh, so we can, we can vacuum form ramps and all that sort of stuff and, and work out if the angles are right, if the size is right. And we can do that all in house and very, very quickly. We can do it within hours. We can have a sample ready to test. Uh, usually it's not, other than packaging for a ramp, or for example a ramp, it would not be hardy enough to stand up to, to rigorous use in a pinball, but it's certainly perfect for us to test, to see if the angles are right, to see if it's going to flow properly, and it saves us a lot of time, money as well, but certainly time is what our biggest killer is, and we want to be able to do it now. If we decide on something, I want to sample it that afternoon, I want to see a finished product, and we're able to do that using machines like this. Um, which brings me a bit of a full circle to um, to Hankin. Some people here have heard of Hankin. Hankin was a, uh, was, Hankin is a uh, business in Australia, A. Hankin and Company, started by David Hankin's father about 60 years ago. Uh, it's still going today and they're still in the amusement business. They've got pool tables in pubs, jukeboxes in pubs. And um, back in the day, they made a very famous arcade table that was, was very well regarded around Australia. and. Um, and still sought after today by people, even, even non-collector people who just want an arcade machine prefer the look of the Hankin style table, so many people copy it. And I was asked by, uh, by a, a guy I knew in Australia if I could get, if I could source and purchase a container of these, table, these copy tables for him. And I did that, and this was the lady I bought them from, but the things that I noted were like this power strip here inside, the money box, that's not even square, it's at a ridiculous angle, just, just things like that. The feet have got a bolt sticking up through the thing and I just, I said to her, all of these things are not acceptable, we need to fix this, which I did for him. And um, we then bought a container of them and shipped them out. Um, and I'll come back to that story in a minute. This is David Hankin, 
before I had a factory or any intention of making a factory. This is uh, some printed circuit boards that I made to replace boards in Hankin pinball machines. Hankin was, a, was not only a manufacturer of these arcade tables, he made six different pinball machines back in the day as well. Uh, Empire Strikes Back is probably the most notable one, which is behind us there, uh, Empire Strikes Back. Uh, some of them were pretty mediocre, I have to say. Uh, David will admit that himself. Uh, but they were still Australian made. He made them in Newcastle, Australia, where Pinfest is held every year. And they're quite sought after now because of their rarity and, and the simple fact that they were probably, they were, they were the only machines that were fully built in Australia. There were many machines that were assembled in Australia, but the, his machines were the only ones that were designed and made in Australia. And uh, that's how I came to know David initially, and I now class him as a friend. And uh, that's why when, when the first lot of video game tables sold, the guy came back to me six months later and said, Mike, those tables were great, can you, can you organise another container? And by then, I'd committed to a factory. And I, I thought about it for a while, and I got back to him and said, hey, you know, we've got a factory now, how about we make the tables, and we'll do a better job than the other ones? And he said, I don't care where they come from, I just need tables. So we started making them, or we didn't start making them, we, we started preparing to make them, and then I thought, a week later, I thought, if we're going to make these tables, why don't I contact David and, and make genuine licensed tables. So I did and he was quite happy for me to do that because he, his exact words were everybody else is copying them and putting my name on them without even bothering to ask me. So go for your life. Uh, so our tables are the only authorised ones. There's plenty of copies out there. Uh, that's just what people do. There's another couple of David's machines there. Uh, it's How's That which is a, a cricketing game with Dennis Lilly who's a famous Australian cricketer. And that's Empire Strikes Back again, another one there. Um, that would all, yeah, that's Pinfest 2014, okay, pretty sure it's 14. And loading some hand and tables at the factory, container of them, I don't know, we, I couldn't tell you how many container loads we shipped out, but we're up to serial number 700 and something. So, um, and they started at one, serial number one is in my house, serial number two is in David's house. So, um, we've made about 700 of those, and we supply them with a certificate of authenticity which says that they're a genuine product and not a copy. On to pinball. Uh, we had the factory, we were making hank and tables, which was good because it was good pocket money. Uh, there was not huge money in it because there's too much competition, especially in China, there's 200 other factories making a similar product. So we're kind of stuck with the price that we can sell them for. Um, but our goal at the time, and, and obviously still is, was to make pinball machines, not arcade tables. Uh, but it was handy to keep the factory going, to, to build up the, the staff, to build up the staff levels of knowledge and how we wanted things finished and the level of finish that we required. And it helped pay the rent a little bit. Uh, it was a good thing to, to work up to pinball and we could nibble away at all the parts we needed. In China, you can't easily import anything. They make it very difficult for people to bring things in. And we're only a small outfit. We've got 15 staff. And in order to import things into China, you need dedicated, specialised staff that only deal with your importing. And uh, if you don't have that, it's, it's just a red tape nightmare. You've got to have someone to do it. And, and I just couldn't and still can't justify having one or two dedicated staff just looking after paperwork to import the pinball parts that we needed. So I figured it was easier and better for us to just make the parts ourselves. And that's what we did. Uh, right down to the screws. Now I know that's a bit of a joke around the place. Oh, you, made, you made your own screws? Well, yes we did because we couldn't find those screws anywhere and we deal with quite a few different factories that make screws and nuts and bolts and all sorts of bits and pieces, circlips and things, but nobody had anything like that and that's the kind of thing that I wanted and it's the kind of thing that pinball people expect to see and uh, so we made that. I think metric or SV? Everything we make is metric everything. Uh, we look at the options of making it with other things and, and we can certainly get it made in China in any, any SAE, AF, whatever you want, but it's about 25% more expensive. And I just didn't see the value in doing that. It just wasn't worth it. And, uh, but that, having said that, that's 6.5 mil, which is quarter inch. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's harder to buy a 6.5 mil spanner to fit it than it is to buy a quarter inch driver. Uh, so yes, where, where there's items like this, yes it's metric if you get it out and measure it with a micrometer, but the reality is it's so close to quarter inch it doesn't matter. Uh, but
but we did it with with the Phillips head as well, and uh, it's a nice deep. It's a good screw. It's good. We had them hardened so they, they don't snap off, and they're quite nice. There's some pop bumper assemblies being made. Uh, we make everything in the pop bumper assembly. We make the coil. We get coil former injection molded outside in our mold. We we press the terminals onto the <coughs> coil formers. Uh, we wind the coil in our own coil winding machine. Uh, the switch we make from switch blades that are stamped down the road and uh, we stamp the contacts, silver contacts, into the switch blades. And we make the whole assembly ourselves. Um, including polarising pins. I get, I get laughed at for doing this as well. Uh, it's pretty standard, sort of a 10 pin connector, usually. Uh, but polarising pins simply aren't available in China, anywhere. Um, so I've got a couple of very clever engineers that work for me who actually manufacture the the smaller dies, any parts up to about two or three inches, we actually manufacture the plastic parts we make ourselves. And we even make our own dies in house, our own mold. Uh, and then we inject it in our own machine. So when we came up with this idea for a polarizing <coughs> pin clips into the into the housing, the guy had the, the mold made, took him two days, I think. Uh, and in certainly less than a week, we were spitting them out of our own machine. Uh, and that's the kind of time frame that we try to work to, that we just don't have the time to muck around and send it outside and wait a month for them to do it. And it, it, Again, it's, it's not only the money, obviously it's the money too, but it's more about the time. Um, the time is your worst enemy when you're trying to make a pinball machine because there's just so many parts. And when, when you can't just buy in a flipper assembly from here and you know, other parts from here and plastic pop bumper caps, we can't do that. We've got to make them at every single part. And, uh, so you can multiply that polarising pin by every part in a pinball machine and uh, I'm sure Jack will agree with me that getting all of these parts together in the one place to turn into a pinball machine is, is one of the biggest problems. Uh, and uh, you know, you've only got to be missing that one part and you can't make the pinball machine. And that is a, that is a big headache. Am I right Jack? <laughs> um, I joke about this, I, I bought my first car here, the Nissan, from under a bridge. That's the car yard under the bridge here with all the trucks for sale and so on. So I bought it under, under a bridge and the second one, this one, I bought from under power lines. So <laughs> both not very desirable places. And this particular new car that I had to buy to replace the Nissan because it was 15 years old is two things I said I would never own. It's both a diesel and it's a great wall made in China. Uh, but actually it's not a bad car. For the money, it does, a, it does the job well. Here's some other bits that we make, posts, bumper skirts, uh, flipper buttons, I think they're coil stops, looks like it. Um, there's some finished coil assemblies ready to go into something um, that have been wound. That's the uh, board, the top board we use in our pop bumper assembly. The bodies on our pop bumper assembly are clear and we have three LED circuits, two that shine up and one that shines down into the clear body so it illuminates the play field through the clear pop bumper bobby. And that, that does a few things, it gives us light right where it's a dark spot on the play field and very hard to light up because there's nowhere else to put lamps. And so that helps us fill that area and, and, and solves a, a bit of a lighting problem in the pop bumper area, in the traditional triangle pop bumper area anyway. Are, are you using plastic for the ring on the pop bumper too? No, no, that's the, the actual Pop bumper skirt, no, uh, the, sorry, the, yes, the ring. Um, no, that's metal, stamped metal. Um, with stand, it's standard stamped metal with, with steel rods. Uh, conventional situation. Uh, oh, it's one of our flipper assemblies, which is essentially a WMS flipper assembly. Uh, it screws into exactly the same holes. Uh, the flipper bat is identical, but it's got our logo on the top of that. Uh, we make the coils, we make the end of stroke switch, every part. Got the, some sort of plungers by the looks of that, some coils. Oh, assembling pop bumper assemblies down here. Finish pop bumpers, don't know what that is, some PC boards. Uh, it was Karen visiting in 2014. Um, that was the office area upstairs on floor five, uh, which we, I moved out of. When, when we decided to part ways, because I could see he wasn't traveling too well, the other guy, we weren't partners, we were just sharing premises and I didn't like the idea of having to suddenly sort out the mess and I knew that we had two separate leases which was very convenient so we agreed that he would take over that lease, I would take over the other lease and I wanted the ground floor one anyway so we ended up doing that and, um, and we swapped over and uh, we'd started making parts I'm uh, going back to two and a little bit years now and we 
those pictures you see there are about two years ago, the majority of them making the pop bumper assemblies and so on. We're gearing up, getting ready for our, for our, our pinball experience. In the meantime, we'd had layouts discussed and designed and we'd organised electronic guys. I'd put on an electronic guy in China to uh, help design up our programming and so on. And uh, it was a couple of years before that Karen had been diagnosed with breast cancer, but uh, it wasn't as aggressive. It was more aggressive than we realised and she passed away about two years ago. Uh, aside from the, the personal uh, problems that that brings, and we'd been together 40 years, married for 38, been together for 40 years. She was the girl next door, as I showed you. Um, in Australia, most small businesses structure their, their finances such that the wife usually holds all the assets, the husband holds all the liabilities. So I had all leases on things and, and anything that was a potential problem for the business was in my name. The cash that we'd set aside for the pinball business and the house and everything was in Karen's name. And uh, when she passed away, of course, all of that was frozen. I had no access to it. I had a factory in China that was costing me $32,000 a month in wages and rent and zero income and zero way of getting it. The money was there. We'd already set it aside for this venture, but I couldn't get to it. And it took more than eight months to sort that out before I could get money. So there was a, a period of more than eight months where I had to find $32,000 a month with no other obvious way of getting it. So uh, I'm very fortunate that I've got some excellent customers. At that time, we were selling Hankin tables and printed circuit boards to quite a few people. Uh, I called around all of our, our guys and I asked them if they could help me out and buy a container of tables. Now, I knew that none of them needed them because they'd only recently bought a container. Uh, but I said, you, you know, I really need you to help me out buy a container of tables. And, and to their credit, they all bought a container of tables from me at that time, which helped us over that period until I was able to free up the money again. And, uh, it was a pretty stressful time, I can tell you. And uh, I could just as easily have thrown in the towel and walked out the door. Uh, because I didn't really know how I was going to hold it all together. And of course the side effect of that was that all pinball development stopped. We couldn't spend a penny on anything. We had every cent we got in the door had to go towards either making the product that we could get immediate money for or paying the bills that, we, that were there. And we just had no spare cash whatsoever for that period. So part of the reason for us being late to the party with Thunderbirds is that we just had to stall for eight months. There was no option. And, uh, but we got through that, we came out the other end and uh, we're firing away again now. This is one of the original initial drawings of the back glass. Um, not too many changes to it to be honest, to the finished thing. That's pretty much what we've stuck to with some minor changes. Um, Thunderbirds. Who knows about Thunderbirds? Who's heard about Thunderbirds? Okay, fair few, that's good. Um, lots of people have said to me, why Thunderbirds? What's that all about? Never heard of it. Um, Thunderbirds was probably one of only a few TV shows in Australia when I was growing up. There was only three or four TV shows for kids and Thunderbirds was one of those. And uh, so to Australians of my age, it's exceptionally well known as it is in New Zealand, Britain, most of Europe uh, knows Thunderbirds. How about Roland? You heard of Thunderbirds? No, you're too young. <laughs> um, we wanted, we tossed this around a lot. We had a lot of themes that we were talking about. We wanted a theme that was primarily family friendly for our first machine. It had to be family friendly. It couldn't be out there. Uh, I also particularly wanted a theme that, that would not go head to head with Gary Stern or Jack. I didn't want to take them on head to head. I didn't want a theme where I was suddenly thrust into, into a a potential fight or a war if you like. I just wanted to avoid all of that stuff and concentrate on markets that perhaps they weren't concentrating on as, as much as their home market. And so we tossed a few ideas around. There's other reasons too. Being a new startup, uh, and we acquired the license prior to me having the factory in China, but being a new startup, you, you can't just go along to these big companies and say, oh, I want to build a pinball machine. If I went to get the Star Wars license, for example, or even the Wizard of Oz, and said, I'm going to start a pinball factory and we want to make this product, I'd get laughed out the door. It wouldn't happen. And I had to do a lot of talking to ITV to be able to get Thunderbirds license because a lot uh, people don't realise just how much money that franchise generates for them. It's a lot of, it's millions and millions of dollars. It generates a fortune for them. And a pinball machine, frankly, is just a spit in the bucket to them. 
uh, the money that they'll generate from that is, is nothing. Uh, so it took a lot of fast talking and in the end I was able to persuade them to give me the licence if I put up quite a large cash surety, which I had to do. Uh, so that's how Thunderbirds came about, uh, for all of those combined reasons. And I get screamed at and laughed at, mostly by Americans. Uh, why are you building this pinball machine? What's a th you're an idiot for building that for your first machine. Well, no, it's very carefully and deliberately chosen for our first machine. And, uh, and that's why. And if it doesn't appeal to you guys, hey, that's great, because that was exactly my intention. It was exactly my intention. And it doesn't appeal to you, that's fantastic. Great, don't buy it. Simple. There's plenty of others who will. And um, other machines, that might be different. Jack might hate me then. We'll see. Um, but we'll move on with other things. We've got lots of other things in the drawing board. And, and now that we have all the parts finished, our second machine will come out rather quickly, I believe. Um, but uh, one problem, another hold up, was that six months after Karen died and before I'd even managed to sort out the finances, our programmer died in his, in his dormitory. And uh, he was only 42, 3, something like that. Uh, but unbeknownst to me, he had heart problems before he even came to me. He was a very, very well-known programmer, a very high guy. Even, even his family used to ring up my secretary and say, why is he working for you, you scungy little foreign company? Why is he working for you there? He could get a job at IBM and all these big places because he couldn't get a medical certificate. In China, you have to have a medical certificate, a current medical certificate from, the, from a particular hospital in order to get a job. You, if you don't have that certificate, I can't get insurance for you, and therefore you can't work. And he couldn't get that certificate. Um, and the long and short of all of that is when he died, I had to pay out his family. Because I could only get, because he couldn't provide the certificate, I could only get limited insurance coverage on him. They would only give basically, uh, you know, accidental cover, coverage at work, that sort of stuff. So they paid out a little bit, but I wound up paying the family 40 something, $45,000, um, which I didn't have, of course because I was already struggling to keep the doors open. Um, so that's another little peg in the story. Um, that's the finished artwork from that drawing. Uh, that's the translight, I should say, not back glass. Sadly, it's not glass. I did want to make it glass, but uh, it just became too complicated to get, to get glass done. Um, so we settled on a translight, which it is. Uh, it's standard orange DMD for lots of different reasons that I won't bore you with, but that's what it is for the moment. And, um, it's nice and colourful. I wanted something bright, cheery, as I said before, family friendly was very important. And finally, machines. Um, putting the, fin the finishing touches on uh, a few there. One stayed in the factory, I think it's this first one here stayed in the factory. Uh, the other two we bundled up just before I came here and air freighted them to Finfest in Newcastle, which is on in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, sadly, they missed the container that I was shipping out to, to Sydney uh, because uh, they, they were earmarked to go in that container, but we just still had too many little things to do to them, so they eventually went out in, in by air. And they should be there tomorrow, I hope. Uh, so, sorry it's sideways, I could not get it to turn around. Uh, that's the staff just checking a few things and learning about pinball. Chinese have little to no knowledge about pinball machines and um, they're quite enthralled by it. They're, they're perplexed by it as well. And um, it's quite interesting to watch them and play it and they do get excited like a kid with a new toy. And I think that, that we can sell pinball machines to China with the right theme. Um, there's a stern Aerosmith at an expat, a Canadian expat bar in Guangzhou. And, uh, but there's a few problems with that because Chinese have never heard of Aerosmith. They've never heard of ACDC, Metallica. They have no clue. Uh, Wizard of Oz, Thunderbirds, don't know. They've just never heard of these things, these Western things. So trying to sell a Wizard of Oz or an Aerosmith or a Thunderbirds pinball into China is just a futile exercise. It wouldn't matter if it was $1,000. They wouldn't buy it because they don't know what it is. And uh, so we're working on Chinese themes and um, we hope to take a little bit of a a lead in, in getting some pinball machines into a lot of places in China. There's a lot of bars, there's a lot of expat bars. I've been hounded by a few expat bars that I tend to go to occasionally. And um, they, they are desperate for a pinball. They don't care if it's a Wizard of Oz or a Thunderbirds. They just want a pinball machine. And uh, the, the sooner we can get something into these places, the sooner we can get Chinese looking at them, playing them, and suddenly we may have a whole new market. We don't know. Maybe you should make a Bruce Lee pinball. We're looking at, at 
not Bruce Lee, but a similar one. Uh, and and probably we're, we're looking a bit more simplistic. Chinese, as a rule, think very simply. And you know, we tend to think a lot more deeply about things where they just like it to be easy and simple. And we're looking at a, a traditional Chinese historical story like the mountain god came down and built this and did that. And that, that's the type of thing that we're working on. That, that there's a few quite famous um, Chinese stories, or what would you say, legends, I don't know, things like that, um, that, that I have no clue about. And I doubt anyone here would either. But I'm taking advice on that from the staff. And um, yeah, we've come up with a couple of, couple of good ones. One's along the lines of a, of a Kung Fu style thing. Um, but again, we're looking for something that's nice and neutral. You know, Kung Fu is going to turn off a lot of people. And uh, it'll be a simple machine. It's probably going to be more along the lines of the can crusher there, where it's, it's not too hard. No fancy stuff. They don't. They won't get that. They won't get 16 ramp subways. They won't know. They won't care. The whole point is they will just bash the ball around, and it'll be this theme. And that, that's our goal to get the, to get a start, or at least try to get a start in the China market. It's it's a futile exercise sending ACDC machines to China from here and trying to sell them for twelve thousand dollars. That is just not going to work, and um, it, they just won't generate anywhere near the money that is required. I mean, they're flat out doing that here. So, um, that's a little bit closer. We do have extremely good sound. Sorry, David, you can't hear it. It's not on. <laughs> we do have good sound in the machine, excellent sound. The guy's done a good job. Actually, David and I spoke about um, doing the sound for completing this machine, but uh, a little bit late to the party, and uh, we really didn't have the time to swap at the last minute. But we might collaborate on things in the future, we'll see. And, um, we've, we've ended up with a pretty good package. I'm quite happy with the sound and, and the music that we've got. Again, some of those elements still aren't approved. Uh, some of the elements on the plate, all of the cabinet art is approved, uh, but there's some elements on the plate, but it's extremely complicated. This licensing process is extremely complicated, and it's another reason why this machine is not fully licensed yet, is that my wife was looking after all of that stuff. I was looking after the factory and the engineering side. My wife was looking after the licensing and the bills and the money paying. And when she passed away, I had no idea how much work she was doing in that area. I just did not appreciate how much was involved in it. And of course, nothing happened in that area for more than 12 months. And when we realized, oh, we're getting closer here, we better pick up the pace a bit and get some of these things submitted. That's when I realized just how much work is involved and uh, that's why we're a little bit late on that score as well and why some of these things aren't yet approved because my time's been spent finishing it rather than getting approval for it and yeah we've, we've done a little bit along the way but we're still a couple of months off from a few little things and we're close i don't perceive any problems I i've got some very nice emails from itv they know exactly my circumstances and why we're late doing it and they're totally on side and uh, they want to see this machine they want one in their foyer just explain a bit of how that process actually works. Like, what do you have to send them? Like, pictures of the play field? Or what are they? Uh, to well, let's pick on one toy, for example. Somewhere, where are we? There's a hover bike in there somewhere. It might be there. I can't really see it. There's a little hover bike. It's like a, a motorcycle, a motor scooter. Um, we've got to send them drawings. I sent them a, a side view, a front view, and so on. Um, a a 3D file, STL 3D file, so that they could spin it around, look at it to make sure that it matches with what the original item is. The problem with that particular item was that uh, I foolishly assumed, when I start, took on this role, that they would know what was in their show. There's 36 episodes, and I assumed that the person looking after it would know that the hoverboard, that this particular astronaut was driving this hoverboard, blah, 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 whatever. Well, that was a big mistake, because they had no clue. I chose, I chose a particular scene from a particular episode because it was the only episode in which the hoverbike rider was wearing a face helmet and you couldn't see his facial features. And I didn't want to go to all the drama of, of trying to reproduce the facial features on a toy this big. It's just too hard, it wasn't worth it. It wasn't worth the effort. So I chose this one and I put in the submission and it's 10 pages of all these models and stuff and then colours, what colours, they've got to be Pantone this and Pantone that. And I said a yellow sash, which is Virgil, one of the, the pilots. And um, they wear a sash. I don't know if the, you're probably aware. They all wear a different coloured sash, and that denotes which pilot they are and which craft they fly. And this particular one was Virgil on a hoverbike. And she came straight back to me within a couple of days and said, I have nothing in my notes about Virgil riding a hoverbike. 
I thought, oh, okay. So I then went and watched the episode again to confirm that it wasn't me. I thought, what? No, I made a mistake here. So I went back, looked at, no, yellow sash, riding a hover bike, episode that. Okay, good. I went back, I took screenshots. I said, episode this, 31 minutes, 14 seconds, Virgil's riding a hover bike, yellow sash, blue hover bike, have a look. Oh yeah, I never realised. She came back, oh yeah, well, hey, why am I doing your job? I've got enough trouble doing my job. Anyway, in the end, yeah, okay, all right, that's good. Because it was, the problem was they had no, no, no notes of him riding a hover bike for a start, and they were querying this face mask, because it's only in that one episode where they were wearing a face mask. Um, but in the end, yeah, that's fine. But that consumed two weeks of my time, almost solid, going backwards and forwards and finding this information out. And it just, it's just incredibly complex, all the detail. And, and I can understand why. They want to protect their, their property and it's worth millions of dollars to them. And uh, you know, some people don't see that because if they don't understand Thunderbirds, they say, oh, what's that? That's just rubbish. No, well, it's rubbish. I'd like to, I'd like to own it because it's millions of dollars a year. Thank you very much. And uh, that's why they're finickety about it, because they want to make sure anybody like me that comes along and wants to reproduce it, it's got to be right. The colours have got to be right. The shape has to be right. It's got to be in proportion. A lot of the problem we had with the artwork on the side of the cabinet was we had the craft too close together. No, nope. spread them out. They're individual craft. They've got to be on their own. They can't be crowded together. And so just the placement of things too, they get pretty funny about it. So yeah, it, you've got to be a bit careful about that sort of stuff. Oh, this is just about, well, you can see the EL panels on the side there. On the side of that. I don't know if I can play it again, can I? I don't know how that works. This is, this is our me mechanised topper, where the space station is Thunderbird 5 and Thunderbird 3 comes in and docks with it. And um, <laughs> that is available only for pre-order customers. I made a promise years ago when I first mooted the idea of building pinball machines and I promised to my pre-order customers that they would be the only ones to get a topper. It would be a mechanised topper of some sort, I had no idea at the time what it would be, uh, and that it would not be for sale once the machines were in production and on the showroom floor. And uh, I've had a bit of a discussion with a few people, including Tommy, and I've decided I'm going to help out the pre-order buyers in some other way because most of them haven't yet paid the freight or the tax and I'm going to help them out, uh, but I'm going to reopen pre-orders, which means that I can now offer the topper again. But once that machine goes into a showroom floor and it's for sale and someone walks in to buy it, there won't be a topper on it. Um, we value it at $950. It's fully computerised, it's animated, it's got a clear topper cover over there, which is identical to the uh, Williams Whitewater <coughs> and um, Fishtails cover. Um, in fact, it's so identical it can replace that cover. So it's, it will be on the top of it. You probably noticed it on one of those earlier videos. Um, and uh, that's available. If you're interested in a machine, talk to Tommy. Uh, but if you are interested in a machine and you want to get the topper, talk to him sooner, not later. Uh, because like I said, I've made a promise to my pre-order buyers and I will not break that promise that it's uh, only available to pre-order buyers. And technically, even though we'll be shipping machines certainly by March, um, we're, we're ready to build machines. We are building machines now. They're making cabinets right now. But we can't put finished machines together because I haven't got all the final approval on a few little knick-knack things. So we're rushing on that right now and that's the only hold-up. There's no hold-up with the mechanisms. There's no hold-up with the play of the machine. Uh, that's all fine. We're happy with that. It's just the, uh, the final approval on a few things. So again, that's another reason I've decided to open up pre-orders. There's been a lot of interest and people have been hammering me about when they can buy it. Well, actually, you can buy it now. And, uh, under those circumstances. Uh, pre-order buying it now is a bit different to pre-order buying it three years ago. <coughs> three years ago I didn't even have a factory to build it in. Now we are building it, the only hold up is a little bit of licensing stuff which, which I'm assured won't be an issue, it's just a matter of actually spending the time to do it. And uh, that's basically what we're at. I don't know if we've got any more for you, that's it. On the there you are. Any Let's questions? Two for one on the top. I'm sorry? What about a two for, for the top? Or? <laughs> two toppers for two machines. Yeah. That's not a problem. There's one comes with every machine. Why not? Yeah. I was just thinking, what's the price point on that two? We, <laughs> we value the topper at nine hundred and fifty dollars uh, because there's an awful lot in it. As you can see, it's mechanised. There's motors and gears, and uh, it's got its own uh, little computer board that drives it. Um, that 
that video didn't show it, because, but it, the stars twinkle and so on, and, and it only comes into play when you get a high score, when you beat the high score and things like that. Um, every machine has the plug on the main board for the topper, so the topper could be sold off for people who don't like toppers. It's still an opportunity to buy the machine now and sell the topper to someone later on who can't get a topper and get a thousand bucks for it easily. Um, so there's an opportunity there as well for people who don't like toppers, and I know some people don't. Yes. I mean, you've done an incredible thing being able to produce all these pinball parts yourself. Thank you. Um, do you have any plans of selling like that part? Of the, not selling the business, but selling those parts directly as replacement parts for other machines and that sort of thing. And in addition to making your own games with it. Yeah, sure. Uh, we do sell quite a few bits and pieces. The, the one thing about our parts, uh, aside from probably the flipper mechanism, which is virtually identical to a Williams flipper mechanism, uh, our parts, they look the same, but they're not necessarily identically swappable. You know, you asked about the pop bumper ring. Well, I think that actually would be swappable because it's so close. But, but things like that, there's small differences, they're just subtle differences, you know, that, that mean it's just not interchangeable exactly. And I know how fussy some people can be, but uh, we've sold parts to, um, to new manufacturers, not so much for replacement parts, but people who are using them for new. There's, there's one, one place manufacturing um, uh, video pinball machines, and they buy the flipper buttons from us and legs and uh, a whole heap of other stuff, brackets, leg brackets, and all those other. The plunger, I think, for some weird reason, they buy the plunger. I don't know what they do with that, but I don't want to know. Um, yeah, so we, we, we're happy to sell parts to anybody who wants to buy them. Um, we do a lot of OEM manufacturing. I've only shown here the, uh, the stuff we make. We make a, quite a wide range of um, pinball replacement boards. And um, we, uh, we do a lot of OEM work for <coughs> other companies, for Hankin. They've got a lot of stuff that we make for them. And a few other smaller electronic places. We do runs of boards, maybe 50, 100 boards for them. Uh, so we're, we're already geared up to do that kind of work. And, um, Anybody that's interested, if you, if you have a need for things like that in smaller quantities from China, because a lot of the factories won't touch it unless you want a thousand. They're not interested. Uh, but we like smaller jobs because we can get in and get out, and it only takes a couple of days, we can finish the job and away we go. And that's fine by us. It, it doesn't draw us away from our main task too much, but it helps pay the bills. So, uh, you know, we can, we can do those little jobs, and yes, we will sell the parts if somebody asks, sure. And anything that's directly compatible, and th there are some things, yes, like the flipper buttons, for example, are directly compatible. Um, sure, we can sell those as, as aftermarket parts if anyone's interested, there's no problem. Our primary focus now, though, is to make our own machines with the parts. Uh, we've assembled up, as you saw, we've assembled up 300 sets of pop bumpers. We've assembled up 100 pairs of flipper mechanisms. So we've made 100 sets of everything. <coughs> we've got enough mechanical assemblies to build 100 machines right now. They're already made. They're sitting on the shelves in our store. So. Uh, you know, that, that's where we're at with that. That's all. Any other questions? You guys have a lot of experience with the arcade side of things and yep. the, now the pinball side of things. Yep. Any thought as far as going into the future about some of the more rare and sought after things like Ice Cold Beer and Zeke's Beat? Funny you should mention that yeah. one. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a working prototype of Ice Cold Beer in the factory. Dude. Um, it's not built into a cabinet, but the panel and the holes and the mechanisms, and, yeah, we, we've got a working prototype. I ha actually approached Tato for the license for uh, Ice Cold Beer, uh, but sadly for me, they had only just licensed it to a video company, and they wanted to wait and see how that panned out before they would expand on using Ice Cold Beer for anything else. Uh, but yes, uh, Ice Cold Beer is, is exactly one that's in our sights, and uh, we're certainly looking at others as well, yes. Um, and and more mechanical ones rather than just video ones. Yeah. You know, like Ice Cold Beer is a perfect example where it's, it's, not a, it's not a video game and it's not a pinball, it's kind of a, a mechanical amusement machine, I suppose, like a gun game or something. Yeah. And, and we would rather recreate those types of things rather than go down the video. There's a million people doing video stuff. I, I don't want to clash with anybody else. That's why we try and do our own stuff and our own thing rather than just copying everybody else. That's what Chinese do. And uh, that's not what we do. We try and do our own thing. And when I'm creating boards for pinball machines, by the way, just as, as an aside on that, if I see that there's already Rotten Dog and there's, there's you know, three other companies making that board, I won't do it. I, it's no point. There's already companies reproducing it. I'm better off concentrating on something that's not being made. Because if you need that board, they already make it. There's no point three people making it. It's silly. Uh, so I look for things that others don't make. And probably the most recent one of those is the supercharger driver board for Getaway. 
Uh, nobody makes that and they're starting to fail in a, in a big way. They've been repaired over the years a hundred times, the tracks are all falling off the boards, um, so we, we make that board. And, uh, we look for boards that no one else is making, that's primarily what we want to do. So I guess a quick follow up to that, is it, is it possible avoiding those two specific themes from Tato and doing a very similar type game? We're looking because at that option. Very We're after looking at that option, yeah. like really cold beer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Johnny Walker. We've actually approached a couple of soft drink companies. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. Yeah. Yes? Um, I just wondered about, uh, I've heard rumors that you're not going to be able to upgrade your uh, Thunderbirds board. You'll have to send the board in. That's right. Yep. Send it in. That's it. That's it. Next? No. Um, I've copped a lot of flack over a phone interview that I did recently. Um, they chopped about an hour of our interview out and sadly what they, they asked me a question, is your board going to be upgradable with, with a USB? And I said, no, it's not upgradable with a USB. And that's where they edited it. They didn't put the rest in, which was, it's upgradable by changing the chip, which is what I said, but they edited that bit out. Uh, the system that we use uses an embedded controller and the memory is all on the chip. So it's basically the same as swapping an EEPROM in an older Williams or something. That's how we've got it set up. So you just swap the chip, bang. And either Tommy reprograms the chip for you, you take it in, he reprograms it for you, or he swaps you another one or posts it to you, whatever you want. And uh, that's the simplest way we could come up with. Uh, I've had a bit of experience with people <coughs> upgrading stuff with USB, and trust me, in 50% in of the cases it involves a headache. They brick the machine, they can't get it right, and, and it, it's not their fault. It's, it's not that easy. People have become accustomed to modern devices, just plug your USB in and away it goes. Because this company made two million of those, they can devote an awful lot of R&D time to make the USB right. We're going to make how many? 500? You know, we can't devote that amount of time to that one item. And so it, for, to us it's a lot easier for a, a swap the chip simple. Uh, because people don't yeah, they're used to it being simple, they're used to plugging in the USB, update, bang. And um, it just isn't that easy software wise. Yeah, so there won't be any, you won't, your machine won't be out, right? No, swap the chip, bang. Yeah. Okay. Uh, as simple as that. Uh, swap the chip, swap the board if you want to, but uh, obviously swap the chip's the easiest option and the cheapest option. Yeah, well, there if, is it's, some if it's an upgrade that we've made a mistake with or something like that, or it's an upgrade that we believe you should have, that will be no charge, obviously and we'll just swap the chip over, you return the other one, easy. Uh, if it's an upgrade that, that you want to do later on down the track or something, you can do that. If you need, if you're repairing it and it breaks or something, you plug a new one in, it's, it's that easy. Uh, but I would envisage down the track that the board would be swapped rather than the chip would be swapped if it's a, you know, a problem. Once, once the software's settled down, you never know, that's not a problem. Anything else? If the top is a grand, how much is the game? <laughs> Canadian, twenty thousand. When I, just by the way, when I when I've quoted money, I've been speaking in AU dollars because I'm an Australian. Uh, but for the last at least six months, the AU dollar and Canadian dollar have been cent for cent. So any figures I've given you, you can assume a Canadian dollars is the same price. I can't quote a retail price because, and it's very simple. I am the importer of the machines into Australia under my other company that's already got the licenses with customs and so on. So. I build the machine, I sell it to the importing company who takes it to Australia, clears it into customs, pays the taxes and so on, and so I know what the price is to be. I can't quote that price here because Tommy, for example, would be buying the machines from the factory and when we close the doors on that container, that's his problem. Once that truck drives away, sorry Tommy, it's your problem. <laughs> Once that truck drives away from the factory, I don't know how much it's going to cost to get that container to, can to Canada. I don't know what the import procedures are for here. I don't know what the taxes are for here. That's for Tommy to work out. So you'd have to ask him. All I can say is that in Australia, the recommended retail is six four nine nine, which is the same as Canadian dollars. But but that, those costs probably will differ to here because I don't know what those costs are so I can't say. And that also includes GST. That includes it? Australian tax, yeah. GST. So yes. there's an extra. Yeah. Yeah. There's, that, that's the, that's the walk away price is six yeah. and a half grand. And what is the rate on that for the tax? 10%. 10%. Yeah, but there's also import duties as well. Yeah. So that's what I mean, it's a bit more complex than that. There's the freighting cost, yeah. then there's a clearance customs agents cost, yeah. then there's, a, there's an import duty 
which is very low. It's, it's, uh, here's a funny story I'll tell you about the import duty. Uh, Australia recently signed a free trade agreement with China. I used to pay about, per container of those tables, I used to pay about $400 for that particular tax component, which became uh, duty free because of the free trade agreement. So I would pay the 400 bucks to the Australian government for every container, about. After the free trade agreement came in, I didn't have to pay that $400 to the Australian government, but I had to provide a certificate that proved the goods were manufactured in China. So I have to get that certificate from a, a government department in China. Guess how much it costs? <laughs> 400 bucks. So now I pay the $400 to the Chinese government instead of the Australian government. How stupid are we? Yeah. Hey? How stupid are we? Now the Chinese get, they're, they're the ones that are laughing, not us. That's why they're driving BMWs and I'm driving an old truck. <laughs> Anything else? You know what? Uh, we're 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 getting closer to that, and I would just have to say this: it's going to be extremely competitive. It'll be better bang for your buck than any machine that's currently available on the market. And I will say that uh, uh, we're going to keep it. We we both discussed it. We want to keep it on the lower end and affordable end because you know. Uh, a lot of the pinball machines are skyrocketing in price and it would be nice to get some uh, uh, more entry level people involved uh, and get a brand new machine that uh, is not going to cost the moon. So. Well I also think a machine at that type of price yeah. is more sightable yeah. because an operator can afford to put it out. Yeah. 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 Yes? Can you talk a little bit about your hardware? You said you're using a, a DMD for whatever yes. reason. Are you using driver boards like Williams driver boards or are you using like uh, P Rock or something? No, like no, there's no P Rock. It's all our own all our own electronics. Designed from Williams, P Rock, or all your own? All our own. Everything. Basically, Hardware, basically software, basically everything. Oh, the chips, MOSFETs, uh, transistors, what's the uh, MOSFET drivers for the uh, conventional IRL 540s uh, for the drivers for the coils, standard parts, all standard parts, and mostly through hole. Where possible, we've used through hole parts so they're easy to fix. Uh, some items are not available in through hole anymore. You must use surface mount. We can't avoid that. But generally, they're the smaller parts that are unlikely to give trouble. But like driver transistors, yes, yeah, standard parts. TIP 102s, uh, IRL 540s. And all your lighting's LED? Sorry? LED. Your lighting's LED? Of course. GI. All LED. Are you using the same system as you go from game to game to game? Or it is our goal to keep the system. We've refined it over probably at least four iterations, uh, and the the final I hope the final one uh, will be a tweak on what I've just sent to Australia. The boards will differ slightly uh, for several reasons to make them a little more universal, like you're you're asking about. We've tried to include as much stuff on the boards as possible for expansion in the future. Things that we don't use for this machine that we believe we might use in the future. And that includes LCD, support for LCD, which we're working on. Uh, but we, when, we, when the programmer died, we actually <coughs> had the software running on an LCD with the home pin logo, it was, it was running. Uh, but we just couldn't pick up those pieces. And for reasons I won't bore you with, we lost all of his work. It's a Chinese thing. And we lost all of his work and everything that he'd done on the software, we lost a lot. And we had to start from scratch. And uh, we just had to make some hard decisions at that time and we did. So we're running DMD at the moment and actually it, it does suit the machine, it looks good. Can um, you go to LCD in the future? You got that? Probably, mm -hmm. because the DMD is hideously expensive to make and very complex and time consuming. It's very, very complex to make it uh, and very expensive. You know, I've had people want to buy them from me. It'll, it'll plug directly into a Williams machine, identical, plug straight in. Uh, I've plugged one into my getaway in China. Uh, but you just to actually manufacture it, it's a very complicated thing. Whereas an LCD I can just buy off the shelf for 20 bucks. It's easy. And I would prefer to do that, to be honest, because it would free our time up for doing other stuff. Uh, so yes, we will be moving to LCD for sure. Uh, and we, we're working on that right at the moment. We're working on the software for that. But I told our guys to not concentrate on that, to get other stuff done, get the machine out the door, and we can build up to that later when we've got a bit more free time. And. Uh, yeah, that's that. It's been a step-by-step -step thing. Lots of things have had to go by the way. So I had lots of things included in the in the design that we had to abandon that that I didn't want to, but we had no options to uh, to get out of it and just to get the product finished. We need to get to the finish line, and uh, finally we've done that. So uh, yeah, I just want to uh, yeah. So we're a couple minutes over. 
So I just wanted to encourage uh, people. Uh, Mike will be around the show the rest of the weekend. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to approach him. I just want to thank him sincerely for coming out here all the way from China and doing this uh, presentation. And I've learned a lot today. I mean, I spent lots of hours talking to Mike, and I learned some stuff today that I, I, I didn't know about. So uh, please give him a big round of applause. All right, guys, well, that'll do it for this episode of the Canadian Arcade. If you guys have any questions, make sure you leave them down below in the comment section. If you guys like this video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. And if you like what we're doing here on the Canadian Arcade, make sure you hit that subscribe button. And until next time, thanks for watching.